So back to regularly scheduled programming. Chapter 17. I just introduced the idea that we're going to now start talking about the kinetics of 2D rigid body motion, right? And I introduced to you the set of equations, the governing equations that will allow us to solve these problems. And we did f is equal to ma, right? All that is fine. And I introduced this new concept to you last class, which is this. Sum of moments about a point G, center of mass of an irregularly shaped object, or any object, is equal to IG equal to alpha, or times alpha. And I set the following. IG is defined as what we call the mass moment of inertia. Right? So the parallels with f is equal to ma are amazing. If you know f is equal to ma, this is exactly f is equal to ma for things that are spinning. Right? And so if mass is a way to say that an object is really, really heavy and it resists wanting to accelerate, then IG is the same thing for rotational motion. It is a way to say that an object wants to resist angular acceleration. Okay? So for this class, though, we want to figure out, I just threw up IG and I never talked about it, so I want to talk about where IG came from. And I want to bring you back to angular momentum. So angular momentum is the other time in our lectures where I talked about things that were spinning, right? OK? And you'll remember, hopefully you remember this equation. Remember that? I sort of said there's a sum of moments about a fixed point O, and it's equal to this change of an H naught, and this H naught was our angular momentum. Right? In fact, I'll tell you this. This was an H naught, and it was an RO cross MV. Right? Something like that. Right? Oops, let's do P. OK, so, so we talked about this. We talked about this angular momentum. And you'll recall that I even drew diagrams that look like this. So here's a, here's a point particle out in space, out in my xy space. And here's my fixed point O. And this particle is a distance RPO away from that origin, et cetera. It's got some momentum happening this way, VP with respect to O. That's my point P, right? And so it's got some. It's got some angular momentum to it, OK? OK, so if you remember that, here's what I'm going to do. I'll show you what happens to this equation when I figure out what my v is, my vp with respect to o. You'll actually remember that I did something along these lines, right? I did, let me see if I can get this straight here. So it'll be. equal to an RPO, and then I multiplied this by M, and then I also said the VP with respect to O is really just an omega R, right? It's actually just an omega R, especially if this is perfectly like that. So this would be an omega RP with respect to O, like that. Okay? And in some of those problems, when they were spinning around in this fixed point of rotation, this is what you would have seen. HO is equal to mass, and then I'm going to group this together. Oops. Mass RPO squared omega. Okay? Okay, so you'll remember seeing this mr squared at some point. I did multiple problems, right? Two balls on a rod spinning around and around. So this mr squared has significance. Here's what we're going to do. If a rigid body is a bunch of particles glued together, I can actually turn this into one of the points in an irregularly shaped object. Okay, so now this is my rigid body.
And what I can do now is I can say the total h around point O, the angular momentum around point O, must be as if I summed across all of my particles i of m i r i with respect to O squared. And all of this is multiplied to omega, right? Because same omega for all particles i, right? right? That's the definition of rigid body. They would all have the same omega. So what I can now do is I can take all of this, and I can just summarize it with one letter. I call this my mass moment of inertia. Okay. So where I O is mass moment of inertia about point O. Okay, and you can look at the units. The units are obviously a mass times two, two lengths. The r squared gives you a meter squared unit on top of the kilogram. So that's where it's different from mass. OK? Everyone, everyone good with that? So that's where the i, that's where the i naught comes from, or i zero around a fixed point of, uh, on a fixed axis. So now what you're going to do is we're going to apply this equation here, sum of moments around O is the change in angular momentum over time. And so if you do that, you would get time derivative of an I O times omega. And I O would be constant for any rigid body, just like its mass. So you get I O alpha. And so that's where the I.O. comes from. You've got to connect it back to everything we talked about related to angular momentum. And all of the little particles that make up a rigid body combine as a sum to give you this I.O. OK? So I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a summary here. I.O. is equal to, again, the sum I, M, I, R, I with respect to O. Oops, squared. Okay, and then in integral form, basically what you can do in integral form, what we do is we take our little our little masses and we make them all infinitesimally small masses that then allows you to integrate across the entire object. So the form of that would be I O is equal to integral of R squared times dm of I with respect to O across the entire mass. Let's do, let's do across the entire body. How's that? OK. So what did I do there? I did nothing but change my, all I did was I took the summation sign and I turned it into an integral and say that all of my mi's are essentially like a dm. That's a tiny little infinitesimal piece of mass of the rigid body. OK? Any questions on that? Pretty, pretty simple, actually. OK? Now. O is a really, really good point, right? If you, have, if you happen to be doing rotation and it's about a fixed point of rotation, by all means use O. And you can, do, you can figure out IO as well. All, no, no, no big deal. The other one is the following. If it happens to be general plane motion, Right? So the object is actually translating and rotating at the same time. 
then you don't really have a point O to use, then you must do this. Sum of moments about G is IG alpha. where everything, moments, I, all determined with respect to G, the center of mass. OK? So if you're interested, I don't have time to go over it uh, in our lectures, but if you're interested, there's a full two-page derivation in the textbook explaining why this is the case. But all I can tell you is this equation works if you, if you, do, if you do it with respect to center of mass g, or if there happens to be a fixed point of rotation O, doesn't work for any other point. Okay? So if it's not g and not O, and you pick some random point P, there are actually other terms here that you can't ignore, okay? And I won't talk about that here, okay? Because you won't be using it. If you're interested, again, go to the textbook, okay? So I wanna, I wanna really focus our attention on this one and this one, and more importantly, talk about IOs and IGs today, okay? Any, any questions on that? No? I think it'll be clearer as I, as I do more and more examples. Um, okay, and then let me let me summarize here where I G is equal to sum of I. M i, and I'll make it clear here that the r's therefore must be measured from point g, like so. So that's the change. If you write a subscript, the subscript carries through for all your terms. So i g must be measured from g. In fact, we often write this as m i rho i. So in this particular context, where rho i is distance from, from m i to g, right? So you're measuring just the distance from the center of mass to this other point on the rigid body, OK? Which means you're doing the following. So let's just say you've got your point O and your x and y. Same as before, but now I've got a rigid body, and the rigid body is moving in general plane motion, like so. The idea is you first locate the center of mass g, and then when you calculate your ig, you're doing the following. You're taking a point all the way out here, this is your mi, and you're doing this. This is your rho i. All the little distances away from g, you're summing it all up, and that makes up your IG. OK? OK, so hopefully that's clear. And then now we're going to do more mass moments of inertia. So I'm going to jump into, I'm going to actually jump back to 17.1. This is the start of the chapter. And here's where they, they actually go into calculating different mass moments of inertia. And all the stuff that I did is actually bits of 17.2 and a little bit of 17.3 to give you context on why we're doing this in the first place. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to go into I'm going to go into uh, some examples right away. So I've just described to you the equations involved, um, and so I won't I won't repeat myself. But here's like a first example. Let's just say lots of examples. And so my first example involves a slender rod. You're going to see a lot of these types of problems. We're going to pick objects that are now going to be really familiar and easy to calculate for you. So here's a slender rod. And I'm going to give you two scenarios for how this slender rod spins and rotates. Okay? The first one is I'm going to actually use, my, use the center of the slender rod 
as the point of rotation. So imagine this is the slender rod, and it's going to be spinning around like this all the time. And I'm interested in calculating the I O for that particular point. Okay, so I'm going to call that my point O because it's a fixed point of rotation. Okay? After that, I'm going to do a second example, and I'm going to move my point I O to the end of this point, uh, to the end of the rod, and the whole thing is going to spin like this now. Okay? So just a quick question, right? I've got two different points, and I'm going to show you that the mass moment of inertia changes depending on the point that you're looking at for this rotation. Now, how many people think your I-O is going to be bigger at the center than at the end? Raise your hands. Here's my I-O. How many people think it will be at the end of the rod? Yeah, absolutely, right? So even without, even, even just without calculating it, just with the information I've given you here, your expectation is that it's an MR squared. So bits that are far away from the point of rotation have to contribute more. So let's take a look at the math. Take a look at how we calculate these things. Okay, so your first example, I'm going to do a slender rod. And I'll kind of give you a bit of 3D perspective on this. So I'll focus on this point. OK, so this is my first point O. Now, the funny thing is I said it was point O. But guess what? If the whole rod is made of one piece of material, like my wooden slender rod there, guess what? The center of mass is also the center of the rod. So I'm going to name my first problem. I'm going to say I'm looking for IG. Okay? So hopefully that doesn't confuse you. This is now my y direction. This is 0. And so I'm going to put my spinning point at y is equal to 0. Okay, and then for the second problem, I'll make this my point O at the very, very bottom. Okay. Okay, and so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say just in theoretical terms that my entire length of the rod is capital L. If the entire length of the rod is capital L, means that if I'm trying to do an integral to calculate my i's, this is going to be at y is equal to plus L over 2. And this point down here is going to be y is equal to negative L over 2. And so I want to say the following. What, I want to ask the following. What is IG of slender rod? OK, so here's what we're going to do. IG must be equal to a sum of all the little bits of mass, but I'm going to have to do integral form because it is a continuous slender rod. And so here's my, here's my form. It's going to be m i's, oops, sorry, uh, r i with respect to g's all squared dm. And just like I said, if it's around g, I'm going to start using the symbol, I'm going to start using the symbol uh, Symbol, let me just say, did I use rho? Yeah. Rho squared dm. Okay, so what exactly does that mean? Okay, so the way we calculate this is. You look at your integral, you're trying to calculate all the little bits of dm. Take any little bit dm here. Any little bit dm, like a tiny little slice of the slender rod, slender rod, what do we know? We know that this little dm is going to be equal to a density times a volume. So this will be equal to density times a volume. Let's do this. So dm, a small slice of rod, dm must be equal to density multiplied by volume. And the density, let me give you that letter as a really good letter for density here. Let me just do a quick phi here. Let me just do that for density. 
multiply by volume. So volume is going to be an area times a length. And so the area is going to be a cross-sectional area, capital A. And then the, the little height on that dm is like if I went a little bit high, a little bit, a little bit of height dy. So there you have it. That would be like my dm. It's like a density times a volume, right? No, no, no problem there. Does that make sense? And I'll give you this, the density. So this symbol here is density. And obviously, density is a kilogram per meter cubed. OK, so why did I do that? I did that because I want to write my IG as an integral. I'm going to put my dm over here. And then my r squared is how far away is that little bit away from my origin, my g? And the answer is it would be y squared. right? OK, so now there's a reason why I'm calling this a slender rod, because it's an approximation, right? I'm ignoring the fact that there's a really, really, there's a small cross-sectional area to this rod here. If I did this and the motion goes like this, every little slice, yeah, sure, there's bits here that are a little bit off from this vertical line, but we're ignoring that. We're saying that that's a cross-sectional area, capital A, and all the little bits, the main dimension that we're worried about is just how far away in z in y units we are away from g. Okay? So our integral, based on everything we've defined for mass moment of inertia, is now y squared density a dy. And our limits of integration, negative l over 2, positive l over 2. Okay? And now I'm going to just do my integral factoring out all my constants, so density times a. And now I'm going to integrate y squared dy, negative l over 2, positive l over 2. So what happens? This is now a y cubed over 3. y cubed over 3, evaluated at negative l over 2 to positive l over 2. Okay, IG is equal to density times A. And now I'm going to evaluate at those two. L over 2 cubed is going to be L cubed over 24. And then minus L cubed over negative 24. So I'm going to do 1 24th plus 1 24th. The final answer is density, area, L cubed over 12. OK? Now, remember what we said about total mass of a rigid body. Total mass of the rigid body would be summing all the little bits of mass together. So a total mass of the rod must be this times the volume again. And so if I took the whole rod, it would be density A times a capital L. So my final answer is this. It would be IG equal to replace this with a mass, ML squared over 12. OK? All right, so our first introduction into IGs, slender rod, and it's giving us 1 over 12 times the math and length squared, and that's at point G. So now let's change the math and do it at point O at the very bottom. OK? So what would, what would we change here? Here's what we would do. So now find. I O, where O is at the end of the rod. OK, so how do you integrate when it's at the end of the rod? That would be like saying that if you want the bit that's furthest away, it better be a full length L away. 
So our limits of integration are not negative L over 2 to positive L over 2 anymore. It's 0 to L. But everything else, in terms of the integral, stays the same. So it would be the following. y squared density area dy. And so I get the exact same thing for how my integral is set up. It's going to be like that. Only the limits of integration change. Okay, so let me do delete. The, let me erase that. And so what do we get? We're going to get I O is equal to density area y cubed over three. 0 to L. Yeah? But for the, so from O to L, if you're going from a, uh, like the top to bottom, why is it not negative L but positive L? If I'm going from top, I'm going from bottom to top. So once I, once I move to my slender rod at position O, here's what you want to do. You want to basically do the following. You want to say, my new y is equal to 0 is at this point here. So that allows you to, to state very clearly that this is the point where you're rotating about, right? So that would be your, that point at the very end of the rod has no moment, a mass moment of inertia at that specific point because it doesn't, it doesn't have any distance away from the point where you're spinning. So now, up here, this is your y is equal to L, OK? Okay, and so now I'm going to substitute my mass again. Okay, and there you have it, one third times ml squared, and indeed IO is going to be equal to four times IG. IO at the very end of the rod, just like you suspected, is much higher than the IG near the center of the rod, at the center of the rod. OK, so there's your first example of mass moment of inertia. Any questions on that? Good. OK, so let's just keep doing this. So what, here, here's what I'll tell you. You won't need to do this integral ever again, right? The idea is now that you know how to do this, you should know, you should put this on your equation sheet, and you should apply it for anything that's a rod, right? Okay, but what I will do is take you to the next example where we do one more example here for a disk. Okay, so let's do a disk. It's like a math lesson in integrals, right? But here's your disk. OK, so they so have perfectly circular disk, all made of the same material. Center of mass is at the center of the disk, G. And I'll do my x and y axes there. And then you've got a little bit of mass out here, right, dm. So find, and the, and the total radius of the disk is, let's say, r. OK, so here's what we're going to do. You're going to do ig is an integral of your rho squared dm. OK, so how do you do this? What you do is you take little concentric rings of the disk, right? So if I take one little concentric ring of the disk, and this one is at a variable radius r. So this, this one ring is one specific r. But this ring has a tiny little thickness dr, right? And it's at radius r. And you're going to do an integral from the center, r is equal to 0, all the way out to the edge of the disk, r is equal to capital R. 
And so your row squared, depending on how you, depending on which ring you're dealing with, that would be an R squared. And then again, you're going to look for little volumes of rings. So your little volumes of rings would be density times the little thickness of the disk. So let me say the thickness of the disk is a letter, say, tiny little letter B. So we'll do B times the full ring has a whole circumference 2 pi r dr. Okay, so this is my disk thickness. And this is the thickness of the ring. Width of ring. Circumference and density, okay? So once you've got that set up, Here's the final solution. Just going to pull out all the constant values, 2 pi b. That's what happened. You pull out all the constants. You're left with r cubed is equal to dr, or times dr, 2 pi density b. And so now we're going to get an r4 over 4, evaluated from 0 to r. Oops. 2 pi density b, r4 over 4. And now I'm going to give you the mass for the disk. The mass for the disk would be just the whole area, pi r squared, times the thickness, times the density. Right? So it would be like the volume of a cylinder, essentially. And now I can take a look at how that fits into here, substitute that in. Should be one half m r squared. Nice simple equation. Okay. Any questions on that? No. All right. Let's see if I can squeeze in one more. So let's do a third example, like a heavy ring. OK, so I did a disk. The disk has material that's in the center and all the way out to the edges. But my idea for a heavy ring is the following. It's actually going to be hollow in the center. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. Like that. It's just a ring. It's hollow. And now it's almost like all the mass is specifically at the distance capital R. So it's all at the edge and there's nothing in the center. And so how do we, how do, we do this? So now I'm going to have to introduce so my thickness into the page for the disk. I'm going to keep it as letter B. But now instead of dr as a tiny little bit of the ring's width, I'm going to give you another constant value. I'll call this a little t for thickness of the ring. Okay. So what happens, what happens to the value that I'm going to integrate here? Here's what it would look like. It'll be an ig. So the g is still at the center of the ring, the hollow spot. It'll be integral for, oops, here. In fact, Okay, 
So here's, here's what's going to happen. Instead of an integral, you don't even need the integral. It is basically this. It is one of these values that you didn't need to integrate from 0 to r, except everything is at capital R. So all I do is I take my circumference, go all the way around, 2 pi capital R. Right? That's my circumference. I multiply it by my density, my b, my t. Right? And I'm going to multiply it by r uh, integral r squared down here. So let me do the following. So 2 pi r r squared. So I'm going to take my whole 2 pi r. Sorry. Two pi r cubed density b t. And what's my mass now? So the mass of the disk is going to be the volume that I have across the whole ring. So in this particular case, just the circumference multiplied by density bt. Right? Think about it. I just went around one rotation, getting little bits of the ring. So if I substitute that in there, my ig for a ring is m r squared, no half. Yeah, question? R is the radius in between the inner and outer, because it's such a heavy, thin ring. Okay, So let's do thin ring. Okay, And it's like, it's like the, the, the R is so much bigger than T. Right? So R is much, much bigger than T. Say R is a meter, and T is only a centimeter, like 100 times bigger. Okay, So I want you to think about this. Here's the solution for the ring. Compared to the solution for a disk, what do you notice? It's that if they happen to have the same outer radius r, this one has a much larger mass moment of inertia. Why? All of the mass is concentrated at the edge, right? So it is that much harder to try to accelerate it if you apply the same moment. Nothing is in the center. The things that are close to the center are easy to accelerate. Things that are far away are hard. So as it turns out, the one half fraction is gone when you're dealing with a thin, heavy ring where all the mass is at the edge. OK? OK, so we're going to pick this up again on Wednesday. Um, go check out GE Week if you have some time. All right? I'll see you on Wednesday.